I don't feel like he's gone yet. I think what I really loved him saying is that it matters that people think about you. As Matt was a, a re-energizing, invigorating voice to be like, nah, man, you got to fight every day to make sure, you know what I'm saying, big or small, we deserve to be in the room. And to, to see and, and, and meet Matt Chan uh, and knowing his history and his career and at his age to still be like fighting the fight. Well, welcome everybody to Unfiltered. I'm Enrique Cerna, along with uh, Deborah Juarez, former Seattle City Council member, and a good pal from Converge Media, the founder there, Omari Salisbury. A little bit somber because it was a week ago today that we lost our good pal, Matt Chan. And Matt was my partner on the Chino Chicano podcast. And of course, Matt and I had a friendship for 45 years. He was my best friend. He'd been battling cancer uh, since, uh, well, almost two years now. And then last week, he um, it, it got him, and he passed away. So I thought we'd spend some time really talking about Matt and what he meant uh, to us and, and also what he did in the community, which, uh, you know, that was, I think, perhaps the most meaningful thing to him, that he was able to really uh, become a kind of a source of power in the Chinatown International District. So, uh, ladies first, Ms. Suarez. It has been a, a sad week, and we knew it was coming, and some of us, uh, you obviously were talking to him, but texting with him, I was texting with him for the Oregon um, and the Ducks and the Beavers. <laughs> and uh, and it's um, some of the talk that we were having before we went live here about mortality and losing someone close, and and when people leave us, and I have a friend whose father uh, was killed unexpectedly last week, two weeks ago, and just saying that you know your brain and your DNA hasn't understood that they're gone. You can physically see they're not here, but your brain and everything else, and every every all your senses still feel like they're here, and that's a real honor to still feel that. And I was encouraging this person and us as well is we can still feel that. And you were saying that I, um, well, Mari, I was just telling um, Enrique, I went last night, I went back and listened to episode 86, April of 2023, when Matt and um, Enrique talked about his cancer. And I'd learned that he had cancer before, like a dozen yeah, years yeah. ago. And um, I was just really struck not only about the banter and friendship between you and, and the kinship, but just like how we talked about the mortality and being a storyteller and what was important, and it was important that people think about you. He's a lifelong learner. You know, even though he made enough money to retire, do what he wanted, then he could do things, be an activist, write more, support people. And you know what? He kept saying that. I know you used this clip when you did the, um, you did that post. Like was it a week ago? Podcast? Yeah, almost a week ago now. Yeah. He just kept saying, "I'm I'm okay." You know, I I had a great life. Um, I don't have any regrets. Um, and facing it, and so, you know, I just, I don't know, I, I got real emotional. I got all that out. But, I mean, and I want to thank you, um, Enrique, for for delivering and, and having Matt there for us um, in his voice and his laughter. And, you know, I, I don't, I know this sounds kind of odd, but I don't feel like he's gone yet. I just, I don't. So... He's still here, obviously, and everyone says that when someone passes, but I really feel that, and that whole feeling about just hearing his voice, and I think what I really loved him saying is that it matters that people think about you. I just, that just stuck. Yeah. Just this, it was a beautiful thought about the end of the day, if you're passing or you know you're going to, that the most important thing, that it was really important that people think about you, and that you thought about them. I think I meant a lot to him to be able to talk about his cancer um, because it was cathartic. Uh, he, he could get it out and we could talk about it and that's what we did. Uh, but I also think he really appreciated when people would check on him because uh, it just kept him like somebody cared and also that 
he kept him going. I mean, because then it was like he had this energy that he would get back from people because uh, feeling their concern for him. So, Omari, when did you first meet Matt? <clears throat> um, I just, I, I would say I met Matt formally probably like three three years ago. But, you know, I've bumped into him for, for years around around the city. And I think that for me with with Matt, which was, which was really good. You know, what being in a small, smaller media and in this market, um, access is always difficult. And then being ethnic media, it's even harder. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times the people who who guard the doors of access to City Hall, they don't, mm-hmm. they don't respect you if you're smaller. They don't respect you if it's ethnic. They're doing mathematical calculations in their head <laughs> to say like, well, there's not enough votes and viewership. <laughs> you know, they got some wild algorithms up there at City Hall. <laughs> and they use them as a way to keep people out. And, you know, it's it's real easy at times for for us to to just be like, man, it doesn't matter what's going on in the city. Let's just focus on something else. It's 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 too hard. It's too it's too difficult. You know, our resources are small. Let's let's put it somewhere else. And the thing about Matt is Matt was a, a re energizing and invigorating voice to be like, nah man, you gotta fight every day to make sure, you know what I'm saying, big or small, we deserve to be in the room. These people need to show up. They have to talk to you. You know, and for a while I kind of felt like I was out there on my own, kind of with that that type of voice. And to to see and 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 meet Matt Chan uh, and knowing his history and his career and at his age to still be like fighting the fight. You know, our 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 longest discussion was about how ethnic media across Seattle can not only cover like, you know, of course the mayor, city council, things like that, but really government as a whole and making sure that government is held accountable to, you know, to our different communities here. Um, and so, you know, from, from jump, just, we just clicked because, you know, I think that we, I not even, I think I know that we have a, a similar passion and, you know, I'm one of those people who I always say I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. <laughs> and that being the case, when you don't know, Matt Chan was the perfect person to have around because his life journey and experience, he knew. Like, he's like a walk-in library, yo. And, and being able to bounce ideas and things off of him. You know, I think that, of course, there's so many communities with his loss that suffer a loss. Um, but, but one, one community for sure is, is our media community and especially our smaller media community, because, you know, uh, at times he would go and he'd be fighting and representing all of us whenever he showed up somewhere and was demanding access. You know, you know, he, uh, really admired you, uh, Omari, because he, he admired your, uh, just this passion you had, particularly during the protests and how you were out there. And and I think when he met you, he was he just was sort of in awe with how you were doing so much with so little. And so mm-hmm. he, I can he, echo that. Yeah. I can yeah. echo that. He was really I don't want to say starstruck, but he is and I remember him using the word cat. Like <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, isn't that kind of a seventies word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well we're from the seventies, so yeah. yeah. But yeah, at that, one smart cat. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and and I think what he also admired was how you had really um, worked your way into gaining, uh, you know, the respect and uh, they the Durkin administration during that time. I remember listening to the press conferences. They would go to you right away in the beginning. Because you became a voice of what was happening in the community. And so, Matt, that's exactly what Matt wanted for ethnic media to be looked at and to be respected and to be considered, okay, this is a valuable source for our community here. And, and we as government better listen to it. So, um, yeah, no. what? Yeah, go ahead. 
getting back to what Matt was saying about Omari, and, and we had other conversations as well, but I think one thing that he saw in Omari is this young blood media guy coming up is that the caution that he always had is people of color should not have to code switch. They can be themselves. Right. They can, their voice, they don't have to be, you know, the CNN white guy with the tie talking in a monotone voice because that's what everyone's used to. Let's talk to you, Channel 4, 5, and 7, <laughs> that you could have somebody like Omari in the front row. And I think Matt and I, we would talk about that. Like what he was saying is that, you know, it's like um, young men like Omari and, and other folks, because I'm not a media person, had to legitimize us being in those rooms and unapologetically being ourselves. This is how we talk. This is how we emote. This is not an angry black man. This is not an angry Latina. This isn't a some crazy, you know, these are media people that are journalists that have the right to to deliver themselves in the news and the way they see the world, just like all the other folks. Mm -hmm. um, and I also learned from that over and over that a disagreement, um, it, it doesn't equal hate. Just because you disagree on an intense topic, it doesn't equal hate or cancel culture that, you know, it's a conversation. And that's what he wanted, the conversation. Right. Because yeah. he felt like when we were taught, he had just as much to learn as well. And um, I really appreciated that, that whole attitude about, you know, disagreement is not hate. It's a conversation that has to happen. Yeah. He disliked cancel culture. And he disliked, yeah. uh, he disliked uh, people that pushed ideology over content and, and things and, and sense and practicality yeah. and discipline and respect right one thing i was uh, going to tell the both of you and you may already know this but uh one of the things that matt had been pushing for and he'd been talking to uh, rob dunlop at cascade pbs which used to be kcts where i worked for a long time uh about creating a ethnic media center and uh so as he got more ill toward the end there he asked me to take it over so we are actually going to have a meeting we're trying to get pe people together to what can we do to create the ethnic media center what could it be and um and the Imagine. people yeah it could be it, yeah, it could be and uh the other thing is that i i've had people respond to me now and say you know hey matt called me and said i needed to attend this thing and this is right before he, he passed away so uh, that's, he was still working it. He, he was still working it. I have to tell you, I, I told you about this earlier, but just a few hours before he passed away, he, I got a phone call from him and it was actually uh, his son, Max, that was calling saying that Matt wanted to talk to me. And he was, and it caught me off guard, but he was at the time disoriented, but, uh, but he was still, he his voice was straight and he goes, we got to do something. We got to do something on the podcast, you know. And I go, Matt, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to talk about what where where you're at now or what? And he goes, I don't know. You figure it out. But we got to do something. <laughs> and then I got off the phone later, and then his son texted me and said, Hey, you know, he's he he was he's going downhill, but he just thank you for taking the call. But up until the end, he was still thinking about what could be done and what needed to be done in the community. And one of the things that he wanted was for us to continue doing this because he he really liked the idea of kind of four voices coming together. Of course, he was one of them. And he said, "You get, this has lots of potential. Keep doing it. So just so you know, so we'll 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 keep pushing the cause here. But um, but as you all know, that Matt had a sense of humor. And it was pretty caustic at times, or funny, I or weird. I don't think it's was called. Oh, that's actually, like, yeah, you would not think I'm it's, giving, it's you it. completely. Yeah, yeah, totally. You yeah, and Matt had that. I'm sorry that when you guys had your show on April fourteenth, twenty twenty three. You did say, well, Matt, you are kind of an asshole. So <laughs> I the people yeah. who are listening to go yeah. back and roll the tape. So, yeah. It's true. Uh, you know, I would. It was you know. Yeah. It, when, it was uh, funny. I often did that, in particularly when we were at the shows about his cancer journey, partly because I would get kind of emotional, you know, or about a situation. And so it was like my way of just, okay, no, we're getting a little too serious now, so I better call him an asshole to get back on track. Cause, and then that would that would loosen things up. And, um, you know, Matt had this sense of humor that was just, 
he would come up with stuff that, of course, you know, good thing that other people weren't listening to our conversations because they were, it was just hilarious. He had, um, he had interesting uh, observations and about, about lots of things. He could have been a stand up comedian kind of guy. I, yeah. uh, cause he, yeah, would, cause he did, he, he was good at having an observation about something and then turning it into a really a, a funny, anecdote about life and so also let you be the straight guy yes. so yeah yeah, yeah. I, and that's what i used to tease him about like yeah. you know it's like yeah enrique's there to kind of moderate but also be your straight guy to to not done totally so true so funny. totally true because i was a guy that was the uh you know i managed the, the clock track and he had everything we were doing and and uh so so that he could rant and he could say what what he wanted to yeah. say Let's talk a bit about what he did in the community. Um, and, and, of course, his big thing, he cared so much about the Chinatown International District. Um, he also, he was uh, he was uh, teaching at the University of Washington for a while. Uh, of course, he taught media there. I actually uh, visited his classes, even taught a couple of them when he was, uh, couldn't. Uh, he... He just the thing about the the community meant meant so much to him, and he fought for it. Uh, of course, we all know what happened. The biggest thing was what happened with when they tried to uh, uh, expand the uh, homeless shelter near the the ID and the CID. And basically, he took it upon himself to work with the folks in the community to kind of create a narrative. He used his storytelling skills. Oh, he sure did. Yes, he... to build that. Yeah, masterful. He yeah. plays a long game on that. It was masterful. I ain't gonna lie, he's a former trial lawyer. He would have been a great trial lawyer. Yeah, and the the thing that I, I really blew me away was how he got um, the elders in the community, particularly the the women in in the Chinatown International District, to come. I have, I have photos of you know leading these marches, and you have all of these senior Asian women out there. He also had his wife, Yi, who played a big role because she speaks the language. Matt really didn't. But uh, so she could <laughs> communicate and, and tell them, you know, what was going on. That was a big deal because he got people to come out of their homes to really fight for the community. And I think you all know in our communities, that's what we need, you know, to get people to get out there and to kind of the grassroots things. Because sometimes they won't come out, you know, they'll bitch and moan about everything, but they won't come out. But that's what he did. Yeah. Yeah. Omari, well, you saw that. Yeah. No. You know, and it's tough. And, and the more the more things become digital, you know, and, and social, the harder it is for, for people to actually people really feel like they doing something. And sometimes they are with, you know, uh, retweet. Or a, or a comment or something like that. And there's a difference. That's why I always tell people, and I, I, Matt Matt comes from an era where, you know, this was just intuitive. But I always tell people, I'm like, listen, man, all these likes and stuff don't live in no echo chamber because if you can't get somebody to leave their house and show up for a cause, then what are you really doing? And some people can't leave their house, but if they're not actually writing a letter that's this logged and registered somewhere, you know what I'm saying? Or an email, what are you doing? So you can sit here and make a post and this, oh, it's, you see this post, it has 5,000 likes. But the same person tells somebody, show up. We try, We got a community meeting. We have to do this and that. No one shows up. And it's hard to get people out their house now because, because they feel like they're impacting the movement by retweeting something. But the movement is moving with or without you. You got to show up at City Hall. You got to show up at you know, these planning meetings. You got to show up. And so Matt, Matt had a, an ability to really cut through all the barriers and reasons why people could conveniently say that they're, they're pushing the progress process. And, you know, the way that he talked, I mean, he probably said it differently. He'd be like, man, that's crap. You think, you yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm I don't know, it was even stronger. He'd say bullshit, you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. 
with yeah. the bomb on on top of that. So. Yeah, I mean, and really call people out. I mean, we we see this the same thing. And this is our challenge: is that in in our in our community, we get people who are online complain about the school and the school district, but ain't never been to a PTA meet, ain't never been to the school, ain't never talked to the teacher, ain't never been like whatever. Or what we talk about, you know. I think I talked about it last last uh, last episode. The like twenty third union looks the way it does because the community got activated to come to planning meetings and say, "Hey, man, all right, we might not own this property no more, but our legacy is still here, and that's why you sell that black heart, everything else." It is hard to get people out their house on a cause. And Matt Chan, imagine did like you know for decades, which is which is really dope. It's an incredible legacy. Yeah, and, and that. That's where the storytelling came in. He also, he helped set a narrative about how they would handle this. And that was that it, what they were doing was not, uh, they they were not opposed to people that were homeless or finding shelter for them. What he was opposed to was, you know, a government entity making a decision without really the voice of the people involved. And he, and he, he made that clear. He says, we're not against the homeless. And and I think actually that was a big turning point. And anybody that tried to turn that, he could come right back and say, no, that's not the case at all. Is that the, the yeah. CID had become this dumping ground, and and, and just, for years. And he just, br- he brought the his story. He brought you know we brought the history of all this stuff uh, in the podcast that we did, and and Matt used that too. Yeah, that's the same CID. People forget that every year when there was protests, when protests used to happen more frequently, that's where people got dumped. SPD every time they ain't never go north they ain't never go to uptown and dump you know what I'm saying and push yeah. people there they ain't push them to lower Queen Anne or or South Lake Union they push them right there in, into into the CID and you know we, we witnessed that and everything else during and, the protests and, yeah they did that I, yeah. I witnessed it that that is where it, that's where they they would they would they would dump everything and even the night for four years ago, you know, as we captured there, that the very first night, you know, and that's where where the protests were were swept to, and you know, the CID a long history is just being disrespected. And it's a neighborhood literally in plain sight of downtown. You go up to Municipal Tower, you see the CID right there, but you know, consistently disrespected, overlooked. You know what I'm saying? It's the voice. It's just like that night, that first night at a. Uh, uh, the protests. I was down there filming, and and these guys want to start breaking into these, uh, you know, into the businesses and everything. And I said, man, I said, look, I said, look at this. This is a neighborhood that's defenseless. Right. I said, tough guys. This is a neighborhood that's defenseless. And I remember saying that night. I said, come to the CD. We all. T- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not remember. You know, <laughs> you know, I think that chop down here. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. That's, yeah. That's the thing is, is that it that it's like we see that, and then so it's like it was really dope. To see like like Matt, who who was older, at least to me, um, you know, who was older, <laughs> but like his messaging could penetrate cross generation. Right. You know yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're saying, and that's that's the that's the mark of a true storyteller and someone who's a true believer of the story they're telling. Yeah, and you know, one thing Matt did too is that he produced a piece on his own about who killed Donnie Chin, who was a community activist and. Uh, sort of the protector of the CID and st- mm-hmm. his murder still has not been been solved. But every time we would talk to uh, uh, Adrian Diaz or whoever we were talking to from Seattle police, he always brought it up. Where are we at with that investigation? We don't want this. To- community wants to know, are you still working on it? And he he's kept that alive. And uh, and that's a story that, you know, until this gets some resolve with an arrest or some so- sort. I, th- I think uh, we have a uh, responsibility to try to keep that alive with, with the uh, cop shop. So I think that's important too. Um, I think so um, when Omari was talking about, you know, he said um, Matt is old to him. Um, oh, this, but yeah, this let's go to the duffel boomer thing. <laughs> um, I, let me preface it with this. All three of you guys are media people, journalists. I always felt like I was just, I'm still learning because I'm, you know, I'm lawyer, ex-politician. I, my brain thinks differently. 
And this program has been, and what, I was hesitant to do it. I remember Matt and I talked and I said, I, I spent at least most of my career over 35 years as a lawyer and, and as a politician, having to be very careful about my words. Um, and sometimes I would let loose because I didn't care. I just got to the point where I thought I was going to go mad if I didn't let my real self out. And man is like, well, that's what we want to see. And it's not healthy, Deborah. You know, whatever you, you know, whether you call yourself a BIPOC or whatever they're calling us now, the voice and the legitimacy and your experience um, and the way that you unload that is important. And you have to give yourself permission to do that because that was my hesitancy. Um, and I also like what Omari was saying, which he's saying in a different way and a, di a g different generational words. But, but I think this is, you can, I think you agree with me on this too, Enrique, that what I liked about Matt is that he would not allow us to cloak ourselves in victimization. Yeah. That he would not, he would, as Mara saying, being engaged, getting out of the house, going to the community meeting, going to the PTA, going to the school board, meeting with your teacher, what Amari is a shorthand is saying, you need to get involved. You just can't sit back and drink, yeah. you know, the tears of the white liberals and someone's going to ride in on a horse and save you because that shit ain't going to happen. Yeah. We're still here, not just because we're sitting yet and, you know, we're so strong. We've not let this group infantize us. Yeah. And that is my biggest fight with some of the power. Um, treating me as a child, that I'm powerless, that um, I, I, when people say make space center uplift, those three words just offend me on every level because it's not your job, white person, to make space because it's not your space. I'm already there. Um, I don't need your permission. It's not yours to give. And a lot of that I couldn't articulate as a politician and certainly not, you know, on TV or when I'm dealing with bigger groups of people um, that are not of the same mindset as mine. But I appreciated that Matt gave me a safe space. I wouldn't call it safe because he would just give me so much shit about it. But <laughs> he, he would just encourage me like, no, you need to get it out. You need to say it. I said, Matt, I don't have the luxury that you have of your broad experience and not being an elected. So I was hesitant to come on your show the first time. And I talked to Matt, I talked to you, I talked to Matt. And, you know, I said, I don't have the luxury to just be Deborah and say what I think. And he's like, yeah, you do. In fact, you have a responsibility. People will take it, they'll like it, they may not like it, but it's a conversation. And that's what he got me thinking. Yeah, he's right. I, I got so used to people treating us that we are, that they're, you know, I'm going to make space for you. I'm going to be an ally. Okay, thank you. Um, by centering, you just centered yourself. So, okay. I just appreciated that Matt and I spoke the same language, but he had better, he had a better vocabulary, was much more articulate about it. I don't know. You, you do fine. You, you, <laughs> the two of you had so much in common when it comes <laughs> for things. Because we're uh, caustic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. like to cuss. Uh, we both like to cuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for sure. I do too, but maybe not as much as the two of you. <laughs> but, Okay, well, another thing that Matt did is, um, and you got to remember, he did this in retirement, too. He just did it to because he, he had a passion for it, uh, is that he uh, created videos and messaging for candidates of color and was successful with it. State Senator Joe Wynn, uh, King County Council member Gurmai Zahala, uh, Sam Cho, uh, Port Commissioner, Hamdi Uma, uh, Muhammad, uh, Toshiko Hasegawa. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. He he shot their videos. He came up with the languaging. He helped them with strategy. And he helped them tell their story and how you would do it. Because many of them, when they started, although they might have had community uh, awareness of who they are, nobody outside the community knew them. So... Through social media like YouTube and Facebook and all of that, he, you know, he shot these pieces really stylized and that's how people got to know him. And that's how that helped them get elected. That that was a tremendous thing to have happen. Plus, it benefited them because they had a, a guy that really understood what messaging was all about. So, I mean, Deborah, we, do you ever wish he would have done your campaign stuff? Well, I'll tell you something I haven't shared with a lot of people. Maybe I share with Amari offline, but yes, you know, so I'm taking a I'm taking a break 
for a couple of years. And I'm not, my political career is not over, but Matt was teasing me that he, he was going to be around to, to shoot that. <laughs> so that was our kind of joke um, up until, I don't know, about a month ago. Yeah. So, you know, when he was teasing me about, I better get better at learning how to, well, as you were saying, I, we were here on Mari when Oma, um, Enrique was telling me when we were getting ready on the camera to take my glasses off. <laughs> so he was telling me that I had to get better at, um, on, on presentation on, 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 on this media. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But that was oh. funny. I said, I, I'm used to government Zoom meetings or you're, you're like, nah. <laughs> okay, uh, public comment's been an hour now. We've been screamed at for about 55 minutes <laughs> for everything, including every world across every war and every country. So now we got to get to today's agenda. I said, yeah, but you're looking at the tired me, Matt. That's not the <laughs> real me. So that's what he was teasing me about. Yeah. Like, you yeah. Can be peppier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all about you know, okay presentation and, and things like that. So can we can we look can we look to the Omaris of the world to to be the new Matt Chans of you know staying authentic, being that storyteller, paying attention, lifelong learner, bringing these issues to the forefront without this veneer of um, this crazy cancel culture. Again, I'll say woke people are going to get mad, and I don't mean it in a derogatory manner. I meant it in the way that it was supposed to be abused. The word woke. I mean, are we are we looking at the young Omari to to bring us to that to that place? I know I see a lot of gray in that beard, though. Uh, he, <laughs> you know, Omari, I think is our he's doing it, and you we just got to make sure that you have the support to keep doing it. Yeah, I, I think that all <clears throat> you know, it's it's just an interesting city that we live in, and that that makes the dynamic that much harder because. The level of inauthenticity of people who claim to like actually like black people, let alone support them or other people of color. Like, I mean, other markets, man, it, it's really things, oddly enough, run a lot smoother because the people in power and power structures and people with access, man, they just tell you to your face, no, nigga. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? It, I mean, anybody who's selling or doing anything, you want a quick no. But see here, you know, we get a lot of people, like I said, man, they voted for Barack. They got Michelle's book, but they don't really like black people. They're called they like black people. You know, there's a new word. They're called foot bombers. Yeah, foot bombers. <laughs> uh. And so and so it's like our challenge here. You know, and I we went to college in North Carolina. That's where I learned radio and everything else. Because we, you could easily spot the opportunities for acting. Boom. Okay, we're going to end you new. Like, man, that's them people over there, right? So we spend our wheels a lot of time. We waste a lot of time and energy here in Seattle with 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 disingenuousness of people here who have really no intention of of really being supportive, or let alone access or anything. For, for black people or people of color, but you know, it's PC, like you said, to create space and make opportunity and say, you know, I mean, our vocabulary has been hijacked. And then the same people use our vocabulary against us to make it seem like they're with us. And so oh, I say all that to say is like, yeah, I mean, we ain't going nowhere. We've, you know, we continuously doubling and tripling down. And really for us, I mean, instead of, to be honest with you, instead of looking at this current structure and being like, oh, how do I continue to chip down this wall? It's like, man, we forging a whole new path. They, this, this, the, the, the way this, there, it's going to be obsolete because they've wasted too much time and energy for generations here in Seattle dealing with the, a system that's here. We're taking media and everything else in a whole nother direction and we're taking everybody with us. You know what I'm saying? Because that's mm -hmm. what Chen would do. That's what he was doing every day. He was. He was fighting two fights. He was fighting the structure, and he was forging a new path. Right. This also giving people like me permission to just to say what I think, and not feel like I have to apologize and go back and say, "Well, you know, I learned another new word." Oh, you're gonna like Mari that um, just talked about what you said about language and taking our words and our thoughts, and then all of a sudden just messing it up for all of us, and that's called white jacked. <laughs> Let Jack ask White Jack. I hadn't heard that one. Our shit. Make up our own shit. Wait, this is our stuff. Then you make it goofy and stupid, and then then it, then it turns into a slur, 
And so what we originally came from our hearts and minds and our lived experience, now you all got it on a t-shirt and you're a big knucklehead. You're not helping the cause, man. Right. Sorry. Channeling Matt there. That, <laughs> you know, but Omar, you bring up what you brought up is a really important thing because that's Matt's vision was for, and with this ethnic media center is really so that the communities can have a voice and be able to create what what's in their communities. So that then um, you're not counting on on the white power structure. The, the, the biggest thing that like what what can what Converge is doing and what Converge is proving because it's like we we we're constantly growing and and evaluating the market, our situations, and everything else. But it's like we went into 2024, man, just doubling down on our blackness and on our community. Like we no longer care. So here's the here's the breakdown is is that if somebody comes on converge we we we've, we've built this space where like we no longer care what other media and everything else is saying it used to be like oh well you know it's this it don't matter all we care about is our people what our people you know what I'm saying that's our barometer our barometer is no longer you know what I'm saying it hasn't quite ever been but our barometer is no longer what Oh, so and so tweeted on Twitter and they said this. You know what I'm saying? So whatever, man. I would use some some Matt Chan words right now to tell you how I feel about that. You know what but what, what I think what the future of it is and what you're talking about is if us focus on us, man, the people be I right. let them let them do like like it convert. Think about this at convert. We're still the same place where we had Mayor Harrell. Right. And then uh, who was just there the other day? Nikita. Oliver. You see what I'm saying? We're going to have we're going to have uh, 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 Morales was just there. And uh, council member Saka is coming up. You know what I'm saying? And so I only say that to say that it's like just because it's our media doesn't mean that it's, you know, one ideology or anything else. We got space and grace for disagree. We got people who are never going to agree. But they got space and grace and opportunity to come on our platform and other platforms. And all we have to do is realize that, man, white ain't always right, man. And so just because that it's on these big mainstream platforms doesn't mean that that has to be our arbiter of information and truth. We have highly capable media professionals, many. That Chan is one amongst many. And we, it's, it's a reprogramming of ourselves as people who consume news and information content. And our, our phrase for 2024 is, we are enough. That's our thing at Convergence. We are enough. And that's what it is, man. You know what I'm saying? I like, damn, Matt. You know? <laughs> he would be just, you're, he would be smiling. He would just, just yeah. We talked about, and we've all talked about it offline, and I've, we've ta I've talked about it with Matt, and I want to go back to something Omari said about when, about 2020 and with some distance, you know, to see what it looks like. I find it interesting that KOW is going to do some kind of two-part, I don't know, graph that, you know, what happened in 2020 and defund the police was a myth and I thought to myself, I wish Matt was here. I would love to just take that apart and say, okay, KUOW, uh, yeah, okay. I see how you saw it. Some of us saw it differently, but we were in the front row of that shit show, and we didn't come with. We lived in those places. We didn't come there with our bleeding heart liberal T-shirt bullshit. We lived this stuff our lives. And so now they're going to have this big thing about, oh, it was a uh, myth and blah, blah, blah. And I was just thinking to myself, there's times like that. I just wish Matt would just take that apart. I'm looking to Marty, young blood Amari and their generation to take that apart. I'll just say this. I won't touch too much on this protest, but I'm going to tell you that it's been being whitewashed from uh, in, in revis revisionist history you. from, revisionist. you know, yeah, from from day one, and it's been it's been revised by all sides. You know what I'm saying? It's been all sides revisionist history. You know, you hear one side tell it that it was all it was, every day it was all Antifa and all this and that, and you you we, I mean, 
which was like, clearly you weren't there. Like your local barista and your bank teller and, and the construction worker laid off, you know, because of COVID were like all out there, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's, let's be clear. And then on the other side of this, you got this whole revision inside of, of history around it. And I would just say that, man, if if people if people ain't going to tell the real story and the true story and everything else, you leave it alone. We get approached all the time by people for years now from big things from Netflix and from all these film companies. They want to come and they're like, man, we need to tell the story of the Seattle protest. One, they know they can't tell the whole story without Converge. So let's be interested in to see what comes out in these retrospectives here. You yeah. see what I'm saying? But, but you know, two, it's like everybody be having their own narrative and that's the, the and their own object, their, their, their outcome that they're trying to get. And that's why we, man, we say no to everybody every year. And, you know, I just not, like I said, this is whatever kind of topic for me, but you're right about that. Um, Deborah, that like, People, th this media, this media here, what we should do, I, I maybe that's one of the best things we could do at Converge to kind of honor uh, Matt. It's going to take some time. We got the footage. We I, don't, I, the only people we put out, you know, everybody else's whatever, because you got to remember Converge was the only people in the room. We're the trusted broker. And so at the same day, we we were in the city, the only people in the room. So it's funny to see all the outsides of people who were never in the rooms. We were actually the only people there. That might be something for Matt. You know what it's I'm saying? Omari, yeah. That's the space that Matt talked about, that your front row seat, and, and, and that I'm in the back, I'm in the government side trying to keep it together, and I'm in conversations with the mayor, with Chief Best, with then, you know, um, Scogans, and all these different people and places about, because I was chairing parks. So I have a different perspective, but somehow... Omari's perspective as a journalist, CD in on the, the street, in, on, the street. on the street, mine in the back about what I dealt with. And someone could describe me as angry. And I was thinking, you know what? You don't even know. This ain't even all about anger or Deborah's just mad or it really wasn't that bad. No one, no one has asked us to talk about when we were in the eye of the tornado. We weren't at, you know, some goofy, goof white, I'm just going to say, some goofy white person all of a sudden feels bad about, you know, slavery and genocide and Native Americans and they slap on the T-shirt and they have like two black friends and they're showing up and screaming about, you know, a bunch of bullshit that's never happened to them or their neighborhood. And I just, I was so offended by that to the point where my anger wasn't, it wasn't just like hate anger. It was this frustration, this, this point where I had no valve and I, I have to say this, I, I really enjoyed having those talks with Matt offline, just on the phone about that, because he was one of the few people that asked me how I felt and how I feel now hearing other people, as Omari said, a revisionist history. Now, then when I heard last week that I don't listen to KOW, but someone told me or I, it was on my feed, they got the myth of, you know, 2020 and defund the police. But I thought that is some bullshit. I ain't gonna listen to it. So I'm mean, sure get back. Amari, why why don't why did you, you guys produce your yeah, own? I mean, what, you got to do that. What's crazy is like, you know, one of the conversations that people were having in, in the neighborhood. It was like you know years ago around the pro this after the protest is that, you know, I mean, it, it's a lot of people showed up, man, for white people. Me and the, like a lot of lawyers, like man, cats. Has to be getting beat up by the police, man. Have a case, call a lawyer, want to file something. They be like, yeah, no, we need, we need, you know, we're not picking this up. You, you feel me? But then, like on the protests, you know what I'm saying? There's lawyer, lawyers everywhere. You feel me? Like, I mean, I, and what would be interesting is, is like, you know, that that there, there was still in the protest, there, there was still a second class citizenry of black folks. The, the the black films who was leading the protest were pushed out by white men. You, you you see what I'm saying? And maybe you saw a shift in the protest. You had all these black films out there every day out in front. And then at the, near the end, there was no black. It was all white kids. You see what you see? You see what I'm saying? I mean, these man, these there's so many nuances that are there that if he wasn't there, then like you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, the cast, the cast would know. And like I said, it's it's the whitewashing of of one of the the, the biggest events 
You know what I'm saying? In our city. It's like cosplay. It's like watching cosplay. I was up, I went to the thing up at E Village and I watched all these white people. I didn't see one black person all lay down on the ground for as long as George Floyd was on the ground. And I was there with the KUOW reporter because she was there. So I was kind of talking to her. And I thought to myself, this is some bullshit. You really care about black and brown folk? Then make sure that you, you know, don't volunteer. You know, get involved if you're going to do that. If you're going to be that ally, then be that ally. I, I, you know I, what I'm saying? I will say this. You know what I'm saying? Because it's important to say this. Is the one thing that, that, that came came out of there that I saw is that there there was it's not an overwhelming number but there there was a good number of of young white people who were really green thumbed and came out there and after the protest ended they're still they learn things like mutual aid they learn things like you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying and they're still out there there's probably 40 50 different organizations you know what I'm saying and the whole point is their cause their cause might just be like okay feeding at an encampment or handing out you know a blanket um, you know what I'm saying? Or even lobby in city hall. But the whole point is that it wasn't just like, oh, I'm here for the moment and now I'm gone. You see what I'm saying? They found a mission and they've continued with their mission. Now, a lot of people was there for the, for the, you can't forget the Black Lives Matter side that was in their yard, in their window back then. It's no longer there. And, you know, uh, it was a moment. We still live this. Yeah, I know. I, all the neighbors that had them around my house, they're all gone now. The Black Lives Matter and hate doesn't live here. I think I saw one in the last two years. They're all gone. And Amari, those weren't the folks that showed up in front of my house. So I'm just going, that's another show. We're getting back to what we're saying. I'm looking to Amari's generation and Amari's media chops to bring up all these other young buds, to be in the front row, in the front seat, to tell people to get involved. And this is who we are. We're not going anywhere. Be an ally. This is what an ally looks like. It is not virtue signaling. It's not cosplaying. It's not, you know, move, now they're going to threatening another chop that they're going to, you know, uh, okay, here we go again. You know, how about we do some economic development in neighborhoods that need things? How about you use your role if you work at a bank or an organization or a nonprofit or a foundation that has money that invests, that builds low-income housing. Yes, that's nice. But how about some incredibly economic centers that give people jobs? And you've heard me say this over and over. And that's what I would hope that these folks would see. Yeah. Not the T-shirt, not the bumper sticker. Matt would love this conversation. He, he would, would love, love it. This. He would and be he, with me on this. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but he'd also be saying, Omari, you got all the footage. You need to put together the the, your, the story that you saw. I I think that's really yeah. important, dude. Really important. And like, Amari was pretty cool. Amari was talking to me in real time during 2020. I can honestly say that we were talking and I was talking to another reporter and I won't say the person's name now in real time. So when there was some blowback against me, I'm glad that that reporter went right back at him and said, oh no, I was in real time with Council Member Juarez. Yeah. I, I was on the phone with her. What, what people what people need to realize is that, like, man, it's a position that we had then. It's a position that we're still in space right now as a tr as a trusted broker. And so, you know, also we were the only people in the room because the city was always in negotiation with different protest groups. Yeah, that's... it should have been a small thing about where barricades go, where ambulances are, are, are going to go. If someone has a medical emergency, what's the protocol for whatever? We were the ones who were in the room. You know what I'm saying? Because we were the one group that 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 was trusted by the city and was trusted by the different protest um, protest groups. And so it's man, you're right, man. I need to. You know, you got you got to do it. I'll help you. Yeah. I'll help you. I'll give you all my journals. I'll give you all my journals for that summer and fall. You will see. I'll, I'll tell you this: why we haven't made anything is because we didn't go out there as film. Like if it was like, oh, it's going down. Let's make a film. Then, then we probably would have done something, man. We really kind of even naively because we didn't know what was coming. We just went to go and show our neighborhood, the Central District, the South Bend, what was happening. That was our only intention. You know what I'm saying? And in the interim, man, we interviewed hundreds of people and talked to everybody and was on the front line and whatever. And so the intention was never to do something. And, and for me, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, people are just seeing this in real time. And so there's never been an impetus to make a film because that's not what we went out there for. We just went out right. there to keep our neighborhood, you know what I'm saying, informed. 
But, you know, this conversation that we've had right here, it, it, it's sparking something. Yeah. Like, we need to do something. Well, you Can't got to. Man. You got to. If I can help in any way, man, yes. Matt asked me something, and it was like over, obviously over a year later, but Omari asked me, and he probably doesn't even remember when it was happening. Omari was one of a dozen people in the community, in the in the black community, that understood and can see both sides, and he's the one that would always use that term "space for grace," which I appreciate it. But would check in and say, "How are you doing? H- how are you doing?" You know, when people were showing up here and other stuff, and Matt and I talked about that, and I told him I never really thought about it. I, I mean, I later, not in the moment. And he kept saying, you know, there's a story there. There's a story there. And I said, yeah, but I don't like to think about it. It's painful. He's like, there's a story there, though. And it's not your story. It's you have to share that story. You're so right. maybe that's what I need to do, too. Yeah, because he, yep. he's a that, storyteller. They, he said, that's how people know, Deborah. I you said you, said you journaled about it. it. You said you journaled about it. Could you go I back did. and you, I, you I got a story. Out, and they depressed the hell yeah. out of me. I told you this. <laughs> we're, we're, we're still, the, the Matt Chan effect is still there. It's because still, he's, he's got bad. us talking about what can we do, what should we do. And it's all about storytelling, telling stories about people and, and the voices that don't get to be heard. And that was what Matt was all about, you know. Is... Also, too, that we can, we can, it just because we, it's like looking at something from two, five people look at something from different angles doesn't mean that their truth is a, is is not reality. Right. It's just a different angle that they saw it. So when you hear yeah. me complain about certain things, I'm not saying that every white person is bad or whatever. That is just the way it looked to me on, on a certain angle. And, and again, we're going back to disagreement or wh- how we saw things differently doesn't mean that that it's hateful um it just means that somebody else wants to hear what i saw what it, how i saw it um instead of you know the reporter from kow who said oh it wasn't really that bad true true no okay it's, you know and again those voices that need to be heard that's what matt was all about well i'm going to wrap things up here but um one of the things i do want to say about matt is he you know, when his cancer diagnosis, it was in uh, almost two years ago now. And even in spite of that, he was still working in the community. That's when the whole thing about the uh, homeless shelter started. And there were times when he was actually too ill to get out there. But he, the Guy was out there, his wife. And still he was kind of directing things from uh, the backside of doing that. And he, um, up until the end, he, he one of his last projects was to do a, a video for the gala of uh, Wing Luke, which was a beautiful piece, by the way. Yeah. And um, he still was at it until the end because um, that was his passion. That was his life's work. And, uh, you know, he's he's left us a lot of great things. And the one thing about the way media is now, we can still dial up his voice. <laughs> and so that's well, kind of nice. When I listened to your show last night from a year ago, another sentence struck me because I'm such a nerd. You know, I start taking notes because I was emotional. I thought, why well, just write things out? And I, Matt says something like, what did he say? I earned the right to do what I want to do. <laughs> True. And I'm a lifelong learner and I earned the right. No one gave it to me. I earned it. And in my retirement, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna be an activist, a storyteller, uh, go ducks. And I had the laugh how he said that he wanted to make sure he was around long enough to see the Seahawks. <laughs> oh man, gonna miss that guy. Hey, thank you, um, Deborah and Omari for taking the time. Thank uh, you. Hey, this is uh, only episode number two. We're gonna keep doing this unfiltered thing because uh, we'll, we're gonna be doing it because Matt said we should, and we're gonna do that. All right. Well, it's unfiltered, also known as the steel hands. Okay, so. well, all right. We'll do a little <laughs> subtitle. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Amari. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Matt.